Hello and welcome once again to this edition of our distinguished UPEI Music Alumni Series. I'm Karen Simon, Chair of the Department of Music here at the University of Prince Edward Island. Throughout this series of podcasts, we invite our music alumni to share their music and professional journeys. In so doing, we look to our students' past as a means of informing and perhaps inspiring our current students. Today's guest is pianist, music educator, and choral conductor, class of 19, pardon me, class of 2003 alumnus, Mark Ramsey. And this podcast is being recorded in March 2022. I am in Charlottetown and Mark is participating from his home in London, Ontario. Hello, Mark. Hello. Nice so, to see you. Likewise. So let's get going here. <laughs> Could you describe your childhood and music related experiences? Uh, sure. I always like to start by saying um, I don't come from a particularly musical family, but I come from a supportive family for sure. So my grandmother is Acadian and she is a traditional piano and fiddle player. Um, I like to think some of the music uh, came from her. Uh, she is 94 years old and still going strong. And it is uh, fun to chat with her. And she shares stories of what it was like to play at the dances with her brothers. Um, so I try as much as I can to, to get her talking about that as often as we can. I think my strongest early music experiences came from the school system. Uh, mm -hmm. I was, um, went to Greenfield Elementary. We had Alan Doucette and Tom Perry uh, as music educators there. I remember going to the music room at recess and at lunch and we'd put out books and we'd help put away instruments. Um, I'm not sure how that happened, but I, I remember that very vividly. Um, then went on to Summerside Intermediate with uh, Mr. Peter Gallant, uh, which was uh, a fantastic program, still is a fantastic program, and that's where I started playing saxophone, uh, alto saxophone there, um, and went on to Three Oaks Senior High School, where I had David Boy and Mark Parsons, and started playing tenor saxophone there with the alto, uh, and had some really fantastic opportunities in that band program that I'm still very thankful for. And then when I was in grade 10, I had this real passion that I wanted to be a music teacher. And I remember my parents coming home from parent-teacher interviews uh, with David. And he had told them that if I was going to go into music education, I better get some piano lessons. And we were fortunate to have a family friend, Nancy Rogerson in Summerside. And I remember my parents called her and she was very gracious and willing to take me on at the end of her very long teaching day. Uh, so I started private piano lessons in grade 10 with Nancy. And um, a few years later, I ended up as a piano major at UPEI. There you go. So let's talk about that. Why did you choose UPEI? Yeah, I think I knew UPI had a really stellar reputation uh, as a really strong music education school. All my teachers spoke very highly of it. Um, I remember going to a wind symphony concert um, with my good friend, Carrie McClellan, uh, who would end up as a, a classmate as well at UPI. And I remember we were so impressed by that concert. Uh, I remember that was an inspiration for sure. I had some friends, um, Jenny Bernard and Carrie as well, who were considering UPEI. Um, and I think it was maybe the perfect combination of far enough away from home, but also close enough uh, to be home at that same time. So I, I think it was a combination of those elements. Good, very good. So could you describe, uh, Mark, your focus while you were a student here? So what about the UPI music experience resonated with you? And perhaps you could outline some of the highlights of your studies? Yeah, for sure. Um, a lot resonated with me. I was a, a piano major, so I was in um, Dr. Francis Gray's studio. Um, I'm very thankful for that instruction. There was um, a wonderful group of students in that studio. I remember them very fondly uh, in our piano master classes in the Steele Recital Hall. 
Okay. Uh, so, so, so let's just elaborate a little bit. Uh, do you recall any of the names of your classmates in that piano class? Yeah, absolutely. So Jolene Robbins um, was playing as well. And I remember um, Nicole Bellamy uh, was back at the university doing uh, a year before she went to do some of her master's work. And I remember Nicole was doing a lot of collaborative work. And I just remember sitting at the back of the steel recital hall and watching Nicole in those noon hour recitals and thinking, I want to be Nicole Bellamy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Nicole's yeah. probably laughing now listening to that, but it's, I just remember she was so professional and poised and her playing was fantastic. Um, and I, I just remember that was such an inspiration. Good. And I remember at the time, some of, um, Dr. Gray's private studio. Uh, I remember Julia McLean was one of her private students at the time, so she would come and join master class sometimes. Um, so it it was a it was a really great piano community at that time. Good. Um, Very good. Yeah. Okay. So so continue with the highlights. Yeah, and then I I was also lucky uh, that you were willing to let me play Barry Sachs in the Wind Symphony, and that was a fantastic music making experience every Wednesday evening. Um, and I think, I think about how hard we worked in those rehearsals, but I think also as a young music educator, I think that's where I learned a lot about how you unpack music with a group of people um, and how you help them build towards a performance. So that was definitely um, a valuable learning experience throughout the program. I remember being in my last year, I did the five year music education program and I was able to do a special studies in collaborative piano and work on some rep uh, towards a vocal recital and some clarinet rep, um, which was a great time to focus. And at that time, I, I thought I was going to go into collaborative piano. It was a new, um, sort of like a new field that I didn't even know existed when I started my degree, but I'd fallen in love with it. Um, and I thought I was gonna pursue that uh, after my undergrad. Um, but I also remember while I was there, I was able to connect with the community in different ways. So I, I taught piano lessons um, and I also took a gig playing for the Stratford Community Choir, and that was um, a fantastic way to build your sight reading skills, first of all, you want to learn how to read open score uh, and live in a rehearsal. But I think it was also sitting off to the side and watching that dynamic of conductor and choir, and I think maybe that's when some of the seeds of the choral conducting um, world were planted in my mind, maybe. I understand that. Uh, you know, Mark, as far as your uh, collaborative piano work at UPEI was concerned, um, I remember it uh, very distinctly, and in particular, uh, a performance of the Brahms F minor mm. Sonata uh, for piano and clarinet. It was, mm -hmm. yeah, it was a beautiful, uh, a beautiful performance. So you you, you mentioned. Uh, Dr. Gray and, and the impact she had on, 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 on building your uh, musicianship. Um, can you speak to any other professors whose influence was impactful for you while you were at UPEI? Yeah, absolutely. I remember being inspired by Andrew Zink. Um, he made history come alive in class, and he got us thinking about how it connected to the music we were playing. And I remember some really creative assignments we were doing with him at the time. Um, and also kind of building on creativity. I remember George Beliveau in the Faculty of Education, and we took an arts-based course with him. And he, uh, again, it's that same idea of building in creativity into the classroom and how we explore that um, with students. And I remember that was quite inspiring. Um, I, I have to put you in that list as well, Dr. Simon. Um, I think secondary methods uh, was a big um, learning opportunity for us. And it was that you are a master of breaking down a skill and helping other people achieve it. So I think we learned how to do that. And I still think about that today as I'm teaching um, undergraduate students as well, how we do that. Um, and I think about Frances McBurney I know she was not officially on faculty, but I remember her playing for all of my friends on those Friday afternoons. And I remember I turned a lot of pages for Fran and I learned, sort of learned a lot of rep by osmosis by sitting beside Fran, but just watching her play, a uh, fantastic collaborator. 
Um, she was also uh, an inspiring uh, mentor at that time. Yeah, Frances McBurney has been impactful for many UPEI students. And uh, I just want to mention, uh, Mark, for, for those who may be tuning in, uh, one of the remarkable things that, again, I recall distinctly uh, about you while you were a student happened to occur while you were doing your teaching internship. And you were at Three Oaks at the time. And, and in my uh, role as uh, your music education prof, I would go and observe you teach. And the way that you were able to synthesize what you learned from George Beliveau in your uh, arts education course in the Faculty of Education and what you learned in your music education courses uh, was absolutely remarkable. And as I observed you teach, I thought, I can't do that. And it was, it was really very, very good. So it's very kind of you. Okay, so, so let's move on. Um, so some of your peer group while you were a student at, uh, at EPEI. Let's drop some. Uh, okay, this is always dangerous because I'm always afraid I'm going to forget someone, but we are still so closely connected. Lisa Sanderson, uh, Carrie McClellan, Krista Rayberg, uh, still connect all the time and they've they're just fantastic music educators um yeah. and it, it's wonderful um to still have maintained those relationships uh, jenny bernard amanda grant terrific singers in our group and i remember playing for jenny um and above us, the head of us would have been uh, jonathan mcginnis and kelly carpenter um jeremy Gallant and lisa carmody were after us uh, stellar voice students as well and krista Carruthers had started by the time we had finished um, and we would connect again at three oaks as colleagues and are still very much in touch today as a good friend okay that is um, an incredible group of of people um so could you describe your years as a teacher at Three Oaks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I taught at Three Oaks for seven years, and then uh, I was very fortunate to get a three-year contract with the Department of Education as a curriculum specialist, and that was fantastic uh, professional development. So that 10 years in the public system, um, I loved every minute of it. Um, at Three Oaks, I was actually hired as a drama, geography, English history and styles of popular music teacher. That's that was my right. that was my first teaching load. Yes. Um, Duncan McKillop was principal and was very passionate about restarting the musical tradition at the school. And Mark Parsons was uh, the music director, so it was fantastic to go back and be colleagues with Mark. Um, so. As part of the drama revamp, we were we were looking to restart those musicals, and we were able to get them up and off the ground, which was uh, exciting. And then shortly after starting, I think it may have been one or two years, Mark um, got the job at Charlton Rural, uh, so it transferred, and I took over as music director at the school, which was fantastic with the concert bands and the jazz bands. And I remember it was about halfway through, and we used to sing in rehearsal all the time as a rehearsal strategy. And I, I remember the students leaving rehearsals and singing, going down the hallways, and we were getting the musicals running, but there was no choir at the school. And I remember this, the students were keen and we thought, let's start a vocal ensemble. And we did, and it, it took off and they did, they did very well. Um, and then one day at home, uh, my doorbell rang and it was Bill Ludy from the Somerset Community Choir saying they were looking for a new music director and would I consider it? And I thought, I'm just figuring this out. Uh, sure, if you have faith in me, I'll give it a shot. Uh, so I started working with the Somerset Community Choir and that was fantastic, wonderful group of people. And then shortly after Trinity United Church in Somerset said, we are looking for a new music director, would you be interested? 
uh, and they had a fantastic music program and I, I couldn't resist. It was really close to my house. So I, I took that on as well. And that was great. Taught myself a little bit of organ, taught myself handbells, um, mm. but had a senior choir and a praise band and a junior choir. And uh, it was just fun to have all those different aspects running at once. Good. Very good. So at some point, you left Summerside to pursue grad school. So let's talk about that. How did you arrive to the conclusion that you wanted to go to grad school? And let's talk about your, your time at the University of Toronto. Uh, that's an interesting story. So Dr. Tim Cooper, who was a choral professor at the University of New Brunswick, had retired and had moved with his partner to uh, Summerside and they had joined the Summerside Community Choir. And I think Tim was really happy to be singing in the back row and not leading rehearsals. Yes. Um, and Tim became a, a really wonderful informal mentor to me um, for those years at the Summerside Community Choir. And I remember very distinctly before a concert, he said to me, have you ever considered doing graduate studies? And I said, yeah, I think about it all the time. I just don't know collaborative piano, conducting, music education. I just don't know what I want to study. And he said, I think you should do choral conducting. And I thought, oh, interesting. So I went home and I thought about it and I started doing some research and I thought maybe I could do this. Um, so I fired off an email to three institutions and I got a wonderful response back from Dr. Hilary Appelstadt at U of T. And it just so happened she was gonna be in Charlottetown that summer um, for some professional work. And we met for lunch. And I remember thinking, leaving that lunch, this is the person I wanna study with and learn from. Uh, and funny, at that time, I had no idea that one of her first teaching positions was actually at uh, UPEI. So I, I found that out afterwards. Yeah, uh, you know, interestingly, uh, Hillary preceded me at, at UPEI, and she and I have never met. And, oh. and I know that she has had a profound influence on uh, your career. So uh, mm. could you speak to that, Mark? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I applied to UFT and a couple other places, and I was shortlisted for the audition, which was great and scary all at the same time. And I remember flying up to audition. <laughs> Um, and it, it was quite a process, uh, but I remember studying hard for it. And I remember after the audition, she was very complimentary. Um, and it was, I left Toronto feeling like it was going to happen, that an offer was going to come and I needed to figure some stuff out. Um, so then I, I did, I sold my house, I sold my car, I moved with two suitcases to Toronto. Uh, I was on a two-year leave from the school board, so uh, that was fantastic. I knew that that job at Three Oaks would be there if I wanted to go back to it. Um, and started studying with Dr. A uh, at U of T. And that was a, a really phenomenal experience. I, I remember singing in the chamber choir and watching her work and thinking, it's amazing. She makes it look so easy. She is 10 steps ahead of the choir. They are learning something very difficult and they have no idea. And she's making it look effortless. And she's so humble and modest at the same time. And she was a wonderful model of professionalism and hard work um, and just a real master teacher. It was okay. great. So you completed a master's degree at the University of Toronto. Then what happened? I did. And then one day near the end, she said, I think you should consider your doctorate. And I thought, oh, that wasn't the plan. <laughs> the plan was two years and I was going to go back. Uh, and I knew she was close to retirement. She was very honest about that. Um, and I knew we had a great relationship and I was, I still had lots to learn. And I thought if I if I walk away from this now, I probably will not pack up again and do this in the future. So I thought, let's let's do it. So I applied for the doctorate, got accepted to start my DMA, um, took over as the conductor of the tenor bass choir, which was fantastic. And that linked to my research uh, interest as well. Um, and then 
finished in three years, just as she was retiring. So it was a it was a wonderful graduation day to have uh, all of that align, um, and it was it was a really great opportunity. And I'm still very thankful she encouraged that and um, that we got it done. Good, very good. So while you're at the University of Toronto, uh, you also were engaged as a conductor with other ensembles. Um, could you could you speak to that? Yeah, um, so I started as assistant conductor and pianist for the Exaltate Chamber Singers. Um, Dr. Avalshaw was the artistic director and they had never had um, a, re a steady rehearsal pianist before. The way the group had rehearsed, uh, they would hire pianists for specific gigs or a member would play during rehearsal. Um, so they were ready to hire a pianist and they also turned it into the assistant conductor position, which was fantastic to work with a choir at that level. Um, and we had some great piano music as well. I remember doing Morton Lordson's Midwinter Songs with them and recording them, um, which was really fun. Uh, so I worked with them as a conductor. And then I also took a job um, with the Miles Nadell Jewish Community Center uh, Community Choir. Um, so it's a very large, almost, um, I think it's 85 singers at the time rehearsing, um, amateur singers. Uh, and that was a, a neat return to that community choir music making that sort of inspired it all in the first place. Uh, so it was fun to be helping them and they were so keen to learn and we sang some great rep and it was just fun Wednesday nights uh, with that group. Terrific. So you graduated from the University of Toronto and, and now you've um, established a career as a choral conductor. Uh, I'm wondering if you could speak to uh, your position at Western University, uh, your current work with the Exulte Chamber Singers, and maybe even your work with, with Podium 2022. Ooh. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I was working as an adjunct professor at U of T at the time, and uh, the position for coordinator of choral activities opened at Western. And this is March of 2020, pre-pandemic, and I was putting my application together. And I remember thinking there were two really like stellar concerts going to happen at the end of March. And I thought I'm going to have some great footage to put in this application. Uh, and then the pandemic hit mid-March and everything was canceled. And um, the application went ahead and it was a really interesting interview process online as we were all navigating Zoom for the first time through April and in the spring of that year, um, an offer came to join Western University, the Don Wright Faculty of Music um, as assistant professor in music education and coordinator of choral activities. So that uh, was incredibly exciting and very daunting to be starting uh, at that time when we were all trying to figure out what singing and rehearsals and music making looks like in a pandemic. Um, so that was a lot of work that summer, uh, meeting new colleagues and figuring out what that was going to look like. Um, and now, uh, a couple of years later, a year and a half later, and in my second year, um, it's been going really, really well. So we have a we have 160, a little bit over 160 students in the choral program at Western, they sing in four different choirs. Um, I work with colleagues, Dr. Tracy Wong and Gloria Gassi as other choral conductors, which is terrific. Uh, so the job comes with a lot of admin duties, uh, which is okay, I enjoy that work. So concert organizing, recruitment, um, connecting with the community, uh, that sort of work. Um, but also really proud that we've restarted our graduate choral conducting program. So we have three stellar master students right now in choral conducting, and we just had a fantastic round of auditions. So we'll be adding some more uh, next year. So I work uh, with those grad conductors one-on-one. -on -one. We have a graduate seminar together um, for the choral conductors. And I get to teach uh, the um, one of the undergraduate choral conducting uh, classes as well. So it's, it's a busy position, but it's, uh, it's a lot of fun and it's a great place to be. Good, very good. And your current position with the Exulte Chamber Singers. Yeah, so uh, I'm very fortunate to be artistic director now with Exultate Chamber Singers. They're a wonderful group of people, roughly seven to eight singers per part. They are fellow choral conductors, music teachers, um, undergraduate music students, graduate music students. There are some retired folks who've been singing in choirs for their whole life. 
Um, so very passionate singers with lots of choral experience. Um, so we do a four concert uh, series here in Toronto and, and some special projects uh, coming up as well. Uh, but it, it's, it's a fun night of music making um, that they, they just read really well. And it's, um, it's fun. We get to the music quickly with that group, uh, which is great. And uh, Podium 2022, I will do a little plug for that coming up uh, the long weekend of May, May 1923 here in Toronto, working with a good friend, uh, Dr. Elaine Choi as co-chair for Podium. So that is Canada's national choral conference and festival uh, happening here in Toronto. So that's been a lot of work as well, but I think we have an exciting lineup for that weekend. Good. Good. What a wonderful uh, opportunity for everyone and, and, and mm -hmm. also for you as uh, a co-administrator of that. Very good. So your work as a conductor, Dr. Ramsey, what values do you hold dear as a conductor? This is where the questions get hard. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I think first and foremost, it's about the people. Um, I think I think sometimes we we try to convince ourselves it's about the music, but I think there's an important step before that, and I think it's about the people. And I think it's about understanding that our relationships with them and how we know them and respect them and support them enable them um, to make the best music they can. So I think investing in that is very important. And that's as simple as knowing everybody's names and being able to have a conversation with them um, about their summer cottage and where they've traveled and their kids off at school. But just knowing a little bit about them and being able to have those touch points is really, really important. Um, if I was to say another one is a value, I think we're doing some really interesting work right now about dismantling the power dynamic of a conductor and mm -hmm redistributing some of that perhaps and acknowledging what that relationship can look like with an ensemble and that's more discussion based and more feedback from the ensemble and I think also showcasing some of our own learning to the ensemble and just being open to that that we're learning together and we're, we are working through things um, together so I think that's really exciting right now that that's happening. There you go. Uh, Mark, these are such important uh, messages about the uh, conducting world, uh, and thank you for mm -hmm. conveying those. So, um, who are some of the conductors and performers with you, whom you have worked, and, and how have these people influenced you? Yeah, at first I go right to the Inn River Festival. I was so lucky that while I was at um, UPEI, my summer job was as concert manager for the Indian River Festival. I think I worked there for three summers. I heard some incredible concerts and met some really incredible artists. And I think that besides being wonderful networking, I mean, it's still bumping into people today and still having um, connections and being able to talk about those years is wonderful. but. I think hearing some of those concerts was a real inspiration artistically and musically. Um, so I think that was a really powerful learning opportunity um, those summers. I think about Dr. Julia Davids and the Canadian Chamber Choir. I was fortunate to be a conducting fellow with them. Uh, I toured, uh, we did a tour in Nova Scotia and ended up in BEI, which was great to perform in BEI with them. But I remember being in our first rehearsal and hearing the choir and thinking, wow, I've never been this close to a sound of that caliber uh, live and just thinking my ears are gonna have to work really hard <laughs> to catch up uh, to these people. But they were so supportive and Julia is a wonderful teacher and mentor and we remain um, in contact. Uh, so it's, um, I really appreciate um, that. Was, that opportunity was great as well. Um, I remember, I, U of T, we had some great folks come to visit us. Uh, Alice Parker, uh, Imad Ramish, uh, Ole Yelo. And I remember Morton Lawrenson spent a week with us. Mm -hmm. And I remember he sat down at the piano and played the opening of Sure on the Shining Night. And I thought, 
oh, I understand it on a totally different level now that you've played that. And he spoke so um, thoughtfully about his music. And I, I ended that week with a whole different respect um, for just the level of depth he puts into his music and his relations to the text and how finely crafted um, that music is. So that was, that was a wonderfully inspiring week that I still think about. Good, very good. So, um, as you reflect, Mark, on the scope and breadth of your career to date, how did your UPEI undergraduate degree prepare you for all that has happened since? Mm. Yeah, I think first and foremost, we learned that it was hard work. Like our jobs are hard, um, but they are very fulfilling. And at the same time, I just remember feeling very supported while I was at UPEI that I, we were acknowledging this was hard work we were doing, but at the same time, this belief that um, our professors believed in us. Like I, I believed that Dr. Gray believed I was gonna play that piece and I could do it. And I, we had that feeling that, you know, you believed in us in Wind Symphony that we could make music at that level that we were striving to. Um, so I, I think of that as an educator now and try to transfer that. I think we also, we learned the value of colleagues and that's the advantage of being a small program is that you build that community when there's that small theory class sitting around and you're gonna help each other um, and it's the same group of people who are going to help support you in that noon hour recital and the same group of people you see in the choir rehearsal that's going to help and you build that wonderful connection with people and you learn that you need other people. You need other people to help you along the way. Good. Very good. So you, you mentioned Podium 2022. You're working on that. Are there any other projects that you're currently working on? Yeah, we have some exciting work happening with Exultate right now that we're proud of. We just launched launched uh, an apprentice conductor program. So it's going to be for a high school student or undergraduate student uh, to come work with us through a whole concert um, series. So they're going to rehearse with us and they're going to get to conduct in performance and be mentored, uh, not only by myself, but a lot of the great conductors who are in the group. So we're excited we finally launched that program. Uh, we have a recording project coming up at the Glenn Gould studio. We're very excited. We're gonna do uh, a full album of our recent commissions. Uh, so that's eight pieces uh, that we've commissioned over the last couple of years, uh, including a piece by a uh, big shout out to Evan Hamill uh, from PDI. Of course. Uh, so we commissioned uh, Evan who wrote a beautiful piece for us a couple of years ago. Uh, so that's gonna be on the album as well. Um, and uh, Western is busy. It's uh, we just were in the midst of auditions, as you know all about, and uh, we're busy planning for next year and what the choral program could look like in the future. There you go. Good. Um, I'm familiar with Evan Hamill's music. Uh, we uh, were fortunate to uh, perform and record uh, his work Skyline a few oh, yes. years ago. And when we performed it, it brought down the House of the Confederation Center of the Arts here. Good. Oh, that's fantastic. Very good. So um, could we conclude with this? What message would you have, Dr. Ramsey, for our current music students at the University of Prince Edward Island? I would say you are receiving a really strong music education, and I am still so proud of the education we received there. Take advantage of all of these opportunities that are coming your way. Um, soak them up, um, learn from each other. And I, I think really invest in those relationships. So these people you're working with now are gonna be fantastic colleagues for you in the future. Um, and just really enjoy your time there. I, it, it, was, it was a fantastic learning opportunity for me. And I'm so thankful. Terrific, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a terrific message for our students. And thank you, Mark, for recalling your years 
at UPEI and sharing your career to date. So on behalf of the UPEI music community, please accept our best wishes for your continuing professional success and personal happiness. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.